Can a shaft nut loosen during turbocharger operation? Yes, no, today you're gonna to learn something. Everybody, welcome back. I have another YouTube video for you guys. It's about a turbocharger failure. I know a lot of you guys have uh, enjoyed the information we share and the process we use when we do a turbocharger failure, or at least the analysis. Today, we have another one. Client sent a turbo in and claims that the shaft nut loosened during operation and it caused the turbocharger to fail. Now, what we're gonna do in this video is just go through very basically, we're not gonna go into too much detail about whether or not a shaft nut can actually loosen, what the actual cause of failure was, and then I'll show you a really short video clip of a turbocharger running with a completely loose shaft nut, and I'll show you what happens when the turbocharger actually starts to rotate. Okay, so we have a disassembled turbocharger here in parts. What I'm doing now is I'm just holding the comp wheel into the compressor housing, which is on your screen now, just to show you what it looked like when the turbocharger was assembled. Um, and we received it. So obviously what you guys would be seeing uh, or what we saw when we received the turbocharger was that. So we would see the compressor wheel or we did see the compressor wheel inside of the comp housing with the shaft nut missing. So okay, the shaft nut came off. Well, is that because we didn't tighten the shaft nut or the manufacturer didn't tighten the shaft nut? Uh, or the shaft nut came off during operation, which then caused the failure which we have before us? Well, let's find out. This is the disassembled rotating assembly. The bearing housing is not here, the turbine housing is not here. It doesn't really matter. What I wanted to show you guys is the extent of the damage and then explain how this actually happened. So, first things first. The leading edge of the compressor wheel blades. Okay, I'm gonna point to this with the shaft. Okay, so the leading edge of the compressor wheel blades are there. That's the side of the inducer blade, that's the radius profile of the blade, that is the leading edge of the blades. This part of the blade will come into contact with the air first. Nothing else comes into contact with the air or anything that the air consists of or has, whether it's particles or whatever the case is, other than the leading edge of these blades. That's the first point of contact. So if you have a look at the leading edge of these blades, they are damaged and you can clearly see that it is from impact. There's a hard particle ingestion is essentially the terms that we would use that has been ingested through the air intake and made contact with the inducer blades, leading edge of these inducer blades. And obviously you can see that there has been contact made along the radius profile and the side of these inducer blades with the respective housing. Now the respective housing would have made contact in that area there, that's the radius profile, which mates up with this radius profile, and you can clearly see that there's a burr that is folded over on these blades over there, as a result of making contact with the radius profile on the compressor housing. What you'll also notice on the inside are little dents, impact marks, from something hard. So something bounced around inside of the housing against the blades and the housing and that has left witness marks, indentation marks in the inlet tract of the compressor housing. Let's have a look at the turbine blade. All of these blades are folded over in the opposite direction of rotation. If you're looking at the blade from the front, that is the direction of rotation. It is anti-clockwise from what you're seeing here. The blades will always, when they contact or make contact with the respective mating housing, will bend over in the opposite direction of rotation. Okay? You can clearly see that there's a burr that has been generated here. This blade has not been cleaned and nor has the compressor wheel for a reason. There's a burr that has been created across all of the blades on the radius profile, which seems to be missing in this specific case because of the severity of the wear, but also because of the abnormal or weird, uh, uncommon shape of this profile. Normally, uh, turbine wheels will have a completely different shape in terms of the tip height, which look like this. So you can clearly see that it is 
a radius profile, a straight section which goes down to the back disc. The specific design on this blade has got, it does not have a straight profile, it has got an angled profile which goes to your radius profile over there. Next we have got the heat shield. Now what's important about the heat shield is the back of the heat shield. Remember your shaft operates like that. The back of the heat shield has made contact with the back of the turbine wheel blade. If you look on the edge over there you'll actually see that there's scoring marks. And then we have the bearing system which I'll go into just now. Back plate, your split seal ring which operates on your thrust collar, that little split seal ring over there which is otherwise known as a piston ring because it has a split or an opening in that ring will seal on the inside sealing face over there. Obviously this is damaged and then we'll get into the bearing system just now. Now there's a couple of questions that need to be asked here and the first obvious question is well what caused the failure? Because you've just shown us effects and results of the actual failure. So what's the failure mechanism? What is the cause of the failure? What I've shown you here is secondary. Some of the damage I've shown you here is secondary to the initiation of the actual failure. So what I want to basically do is go into the bearing system, explain a few things about the bearing system so that you can understand the actual working of a turbocharger and what needs to happen in order for blades, whether it be the turbine or compressor side, to be able to make contact with the mating housing. Guys, what I want to explain to you here, just quickly show you, is the clearance between a radius profile, which is this section of the blade over there, and the machined face of the inside of a turbine housing over there. I'm going to move the blade and turn the blade so that they are about to mate or come into position where you can actually see the clearance between the blade and the actual housing radius profile. Now we've got a radius profile ground onto the turbine wheel blades which mate 100% along the radius profile of the actual turbine housing. In order for the radius profile to make contact with the housing, you will need axial movement, excessive axial movement, which means the bearing system needs to be damaged. If you have axial movement, or end float is the other, other term for it, you will only make contact between the radius profile and the radius profile of the housing. You will not find burrs or contact made between the sides of the inducer blades and the housing. That is radial, that is axial. Right, now let's go to the bearing system and I wanna show you something. Okay guys, so we've got the components that make up the bearing system, yes, obviously with the shaft as well. The shaft used to be attached to the turbine head like so. It's obviously broken off. Now, what I wanna show or point out is the elephant in the room. Have a look at the thrust bearing. Those pads over there should actually look something like that. Three separate pads, thrust pads with grooves between them to allow for oil to come between. This should actually have three or four, no actually three. And the reason is because there's three oil holes which you can clearly see over there, which would feed those pads. Those pads have been ground away. The next thing I want to show you is have a look at the clearance between the outside diameter of the shaft and the inside diameter of the bearing. So I'm going to put the bearing on here. That's the area, the running face, that mates with the inside of the bearing. I'm going to put it on and push it to the one side. Note the clearance between the shaft and the bearing as I move it. Can you see that clearance? This is present on both the turbine side as you can see how loose this bearing is on the shaft, as well as the compressor side. We also have abnormal wear on the thrust bearing face. This is the assembly of these components. That thrust collar goes there, this thrust pad goes on the opposite side, and then we have another steel collar with the piston ring over there, which seals in the back plate, 
the opposite side goes in there. Right, so this is essentially how these are clamped down with the shaft through it. Have a look at the clearance over there. That is axial clearance. And obviously, that would be radial clearance. So that is radial clearance, allowing the shaft to go up and down. And the opposite side is axial, which would obviously I've just shown you now, which allows the shaft to move in and out. Now, let's look at the common denominator here. All of these bearing components are equally worn. Obviously, if you have axial movement in the shaft, both compressor and turbine radius profiles will make contact with their respective mating housings. At the same time, you've got radial clearance, which will obviously allow the sides of the blades, which are in this case bent over, and in this case also bent over in the opposite direction of rotation, to make contact with the side of the housing. Now, the shaft nut is missing. The shaft nut came loose. I say that in inverted commas for a reason, and you'll see the picture now. The light bulbs will switch on. You have axial and radial play, allowing both turbine and compressor wheels to make contact with the housings. We've just said that. We've identified that through the axial play, you'll be allowed, or you are allowing the radius profiles on the other side to make contact with the radius profile on the housings, as well as the, the radial play will allow you to make contact with the sides of the blades, inducer and extrusor on both compressor and turbine. What happens? If a rotating assembly is rotating at speed and comes to a sudden stop. Before I give you the answer, I'll ask you another question. What direction, whilst looking at the compressor wheel from the front, does the compressor wheel turn with a normal rotation compressor, not with a counter rotation. This is a normal rotation compressor. What direction, while looking at the compressor wheel, does it turn? It turns clockwise. What direction does the shaft nut that attaches to the other end of the shaft when the compressor wheel is on tighten whilst looking at the compressor? Remember, compressor turns clockwise. The shaft nut tightens anti-clockwise. Fact. In a counter-rotation turbocharger, the direction of rotation while looking at the front of the compressor will be anti-clockwise and the direction to tighten the shaft nut would be clockwise, always opposite. During operation, it is not possible to, for a shaft nut to loosen, regardless of whether you have a normal rotation compressor or a counter rotation compressor. I'm gonna go downstairs now and show you a video where we have got a core assembly on a, flow, on a balancing machine and I'm gonna loosen the shaft nut where there's about a four or a five millimeter gap between the actual compressor nose and the base of the, comp of, of the shaft nut. And I'm gonna do a run. I'll put the shroud on, I'll run the turbocharger to probably 140, 160,000 RPM, and I'll open it up and let's see what happens. Before we do that, I wanna give you an answer on the first question. Is it possible for a shaft nut to come loose? No, it's not. I think I've given you that answer already. Let's go downstairs to the workshop quickly. Let me show you that short excerpt and then we'll come back and close off. Okay guys, so we're sitting in front of the VSR. What I'm gonna do now is I've loaded a rotating assembly onto the, the, the VSR and I'm gonna actually show you where I've loosened the shaft nut and there's probably about a three or a four millimeter gap around about there. I'm not gonna measure it, but you can clearly see it with the eye where the shaft nut is actually unscrewed. And I'm gonna close the, uh, uh, the VSR, we're gonna run, do a run, probably get to about 100,000 RPM, 80,000 RPM uh, estimate. And then I'm gonna open up, remove the shroud, and let's see what we find. Right, so we've got a, a, a rotating assembly on the uh, balancing machine. You can see clearly that the shaft nut is loose. I'm gonna loosen it, take it off completely, put it back on again. It's not a trick. You can see that it's not coming off. It's, it's a proper shaft nut. Uh, there's gonna be some naysayers, but anyway, let's go down the road. Uh, there's about a three millimeter gap over there between the base of the shaft nut and the nose of the compressor wheel. We're gonna leave it in that position over there. We're gonna close the shroud. We're gonna lock this up and we're gonna do a run. I'm gonna have to close the, uh, the hatch. So we're just gonna take the camera back, but we're not gonna 
uh, um, switch off the camera. We're just going to move the camera like this. So excuse the picture quality for a second while I close. It might not have to move. Let's just have a look. Okay, it had to move. Right, I don't know if you can see that. Great stuff. Sorry, Mr. Cameraman. I'm going to do a run now and I'm going to open up the shot afterwards and show you what we've got. Right, here we go. Oh my greatness, where's the gap gone? The turbocharger, when rotates, will suck the nut on and actually tighten during operation. Alright guys, so you've just seen a video where as soon as you run a turbocharger at normal rotation uh, direction, a loose shaft nut will automatically tighten. It is not possible for a shaft nut to come off during normal operation. Normal operation. However, in abnormal operation or excessive operating conditions as we term it, let's say for example this compressor wheel is turning in a clockwise direction and comes to a sudden stop. Let's recap. Normal operation when looking at the compressor is clockwise. Tighten the compressor wheel or the shaft nut anti-clockwise. What direction do you loosen the shaft nut? Clockwise. If this is turning in a clockwise direction and comes to a sudden stop, it's going to spin, loosen, and unscrew the shaft nut, isn't it? In an exceptional operating condition, the shaft nut can loosen. Sometimes it loosens during a bearing seizure and then the rotating assembly becomes loose again after a seizure, that's for another video, and it will suck the compressor wheel back onto the shaft because it hasn't completely come off. Other times, the seizure will be so severe that it actually spits the shaft nut completely off, and then as the rotating assembly begins to turn again, it sucks that compressor, the, the shaft nut back in again and damages the leading edge of the blades. Well guys, I hope you guys enjoyed that. I hope it was informative. I hope you guys learned something. Post some comments down below. Let's see what you guys have to say about that. Remember, subscribe, like, catch you next time.